Hello and welcome to the complete guide on the King's Indian defense. In this video, we're going to be exploring all of the lines that you need to know, as well as the ideas and some master games to tackle the King's Indian defense with the black side and beat the white pieces. As always, there is a PGN file in the description below, along with timestamps if you want to skip around the video, which might be kind of useful for today because there's quite a lot of theory. Um, and I'm going to make it as simple and strategically coherent as possible. But we do have to cover the Samish variation, the Fianchetto variation, the Four Pawns variation, and the classical Knight F3. So I don't want to waste any more time you're watching the Chess Geek channel, we upload every other day, so make sure you subscribe. Let's jump straight in to the King's Indian defense. The King's Indian, if I back up for a second, begins after d4, and instead of immediately contesting the center with a move like d5, we go for knight to f6. We're going to basically delay the center expansion and first prioritize peace development. So we develop the king side, and now after they play the move e4, they're threatening to run us over with e5, so at this point, we go ahead and stop that by playing d6, which also prepares both c5 and e5 at a later time, and we're also happy to castle soon. So what options does white have? Well, I'm going to start with the main main line. If you only want to memorize one specific sub variation, this is what you should look at because it's most common knight to f3, the classical variation. We're going to continue by castling, which is basically what we're going to do in most of these positions. And after we castle, they're going to develop their bishop, bishop e2. This is the main variation. Now in this position, and I should mention in all positions, there are many, many ways to play the king's Indian. You can play in this position knight a6, you can play knight to c6, you can play knight d7, you can consider c5, or you can go for my recommendation, which is by far the most popular, the main line e5. Now, this might look at first glance like a sacrifice, and in some ways it is, but they can't really accept it. If they were to take, we're going to capture back, and in this position, if they trade queens and say, hey, free pawn, let's go, well, not exactly, because now we have this nice idea, knight takes on e4. If they take back, we're going to take, we regain the material, we have better development, our king is castled, we're going to be able to continue our development with bishop f5 with tempo, get the, the knight out, we have more control over the d-file. This is a position where black is already equalized, if not better. And so alternatively, they could try to throw in this position the move knight f7, a desperado to win a pawn and then take the piece. But this loses because we now have bishop c3 check and now we take. And if you count the material, we're up an entire piece. And so that's an important detail to notice because this is basically the justification for the pawn sacrifice and the reason that they cannot accept it. I should mention, they don't have to take directly, and they can instead first start with a move like bishop g5, but in this position, uh, you can play a bit precisely, and this is an important one to know, you go rook e8. You defend the pawn, get out of the pin, and from here, it's a very casual way to continue. Essentially, what we're going to do after they castle is we're going to play knight a6. Now, why do we get the knight out from here? Well, first of all, it's heading towards c5 to put pressure on the pawn. But further, we don't want to put the knight on c6 because then we're blocking the move c6 for us. And this is a huge move to understand. In any endgame situation in the King's Indian, put the pawn on c6. It greatly restricts the white knight and makes progress for the white pieces really difficult. And so, for example, they're going to get the rook in, we go knight c5, put pressure, they're going to move the bishop and defend, and now c6. We continue uh, to just harass their knight, they can't really, you know, pr make progress now, and our continuing ideas is basically to develop the bishop um, and continue from there. For example, we can go h6, and, you know, if they move the bishop, we can continue by, you know, rerouting the knight towards here, maybe with the other knight, get the bishop out. This is roughly equal in this position, um, and we're certainly not worse. And so going back, this is the main idea if they were to take the pawn. And so they're not going to take. And instead, they're likely going to ignore this and just castle. So what do we do now? Well, here comes an important move, knight to c6. We're putting pressure on the pawn. We're encouraging them to push. But now we play the move 97. Now, what is the idea with the move 97? Well, one of the things to notice, they have an advantage on the queen side. They're going to try to progress and eventually run us over on the queen side. 
And alternatively, in turn, we're going to make progress on the king side. And the main breakthrough is f5. The knight now nicely supports this breakthrough. And I have a nice game example to illustrate this concept. Um, they're probably going to, in one way or another, reroute this knight over uh, to the queen side to help with um, you know the the further progression of the pawns, but also to make the move f3 possible to meet f5 with f3. Um, and, and I have a nice game by Hikaru Nakamura, one of his immortal games, which beautifully illustrates the main essence of the King's Indian. They're launching r uh, ruthlessly on the queen side, and we do the same on the king side. But there's one key distinction: we don't have a king on the queen side. So even if they crash through, at the very least. You know, we can give away a couple of, of pawns and survive. For them, they don't have that same luxury because we're going for their king directly. And so this move of going g5, making room for the knight, and also again continuing to make progress with the pawns, and that's the way that you make progress in general in the King's Indian. You build up a strong pawn chain, and with the aid and support of the bishop and knight, you're going to continue pushing your pawns. And so we see this rook to f7, uh, defending a little on the queen side, adding flexibility on the king side and helping with the attack. And this is a really nice game. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the immortal games of Hikaru where he sacrifices a lot of pieces, sacrificing the knight here. Um, and then the queen is hanging, but he doesn't care. He takes the rook because if you take the queen, it is mate. Very beautiful, and uh, he continues to sacrifice the queen here. You'll see bishop to h3. If you, again, you take the queen, it's mate. And so you can see how fun the king Indian can be when it's played right. Another sacrifice with the queen. I'm going very quickly through this game because we've reached you know a very specific uh, end game, middle game position. It's not so much the theory anymore, but it does illustrate the beautiful ideas that exist in the king's Indian. We have knight takes e5, and again, leaving the queen hanging for a sixth time, because if you take, it is checkmate. Um, and finally, Karu manages to regain some material, and I mean, this endgame is completely winning. You're up material, and uh, white resigned. So going all the way back, you can see how fun the King's Indian can be. You sacrifice your pawns, launching them at the opponent, and then use your minor pieces, your rooks, your bishops, and sometimes your queen to attack the king. And again, you can see that the attack on the queen side for white was fruitless because there's no important piece there. We're not, you know, in risk of losing a king, losing the game. They're at the very worst going to take a couple of pawns. Now, I do want to go back until this moment. And if you recall, white ignored the tension after e5. They castled, we go knight to c6. They don't have to push. They can defend the pawn. But now we have the move knight g4. This is a nice way to add the knight, to add the pressure. We're threatening to, you know, get up the bishop pair and again, continue to go for our f5. We're insisting on breaking through. And this f5 pawn push, this is the way that we usually are going to make progress. Now, finally, they have the ability after e5 to push. Now, in this case, we don't have the ability to reroute the knight via c6 but we do have the ability to do so via a6. I prefer a6 over d7 because the bishop is now open and the knight is still heading towards c5. And, you know, this is a very peaceful situation. The center is locked up. And for example here, we don't want to give them the opportunity to go b4. Notice they did not have that opportunity here because they hang a pawn. Um, so they defend the pawn, and now we don't want to give them the opportunity, so we go a5 to stop the move b4, and we essentially have total control. We control the queen side, they can't kick away this knight, which is a huge menacing piece over here. We control the center with our knights, and at some point, we can look to make some expansion as well, the typical idea of going f5. And so in this position, when they force our hands by locking up the center and not giving us as much mobility with our knight, it does mean that we're not going to get as much of a dangerous attack, but at the same time, there's no counterplay for white. They're not getting any attack on the queen side either. So this is a far more peaceful and calm way uh, for the game to go, and it's definitely not something that you should be scared of. So this takes us to the end of the classical variation. If they just develop our pieces, we quickly launch with e5. I know that was a lot to take in, a lot of ideas. I'd urge you, because this is the main variation, perhaps rewatch this. Again, there's a PGN down below, so if you want to play through the moves yourself, you're more than welcome to do so. I think this is the main ideas uh, to, to capture. But now we're going to look at some of these sub variations that are still important to know, but just not as uh, important or critical. Critical. One of those is the same-ish with f3. The main idea of the same-ish is to play the, the bishop to e3 quickly and then bring the queen out to d2 
And the reason that f3 is so powerful is because it could help with an attack with g4, but also it restricts the knight from coming to g4 and harassing the bishop like we saw in a couple of the uh, variations previously. And so what do we do? Well, this doesn't change the first move. We're going to castle. They're going to go bishop e3. And here I, I recommend the move c5 instead of the move e5. Now, why? Well, at its core, this bishop can become very, very powerful. And especially because they immediately took the time to break out their bishop, this pawn here is weak. It's undefended. And so if we can open up this diagonal, there's going to be weaknesses that are going to be hard uh, to come back from. And so that's kind of the strategical uh, justification for going for the immediate c5. Now, what's the tactical justification? Because aren't we just giving away a pawn? Well, if they choose to take this pawn and they take here, we're going to take back. And it is true that they can take a pawn. But again, because this diagonal is open, because we have a superior lead in development, they're attacking this pawn. So knight to c6 defends. We're going to be able to win back likely the material. Their king is in the open. We have a lot of compensation. The engine also corroborates this. I mean, we're doing completely fine here. The knight develops. We can go b6 and attack the bishop. We can then develop our own bishop. We're getting the other rook into the game. And we're going to be able to put some immediate pressure on their center. There's a game example that I want to illustrate here that shows this. You saw this rerouting maneuver. And eventually the pawn here becomes weak. Um, notice they can't really defend it because, again, then this bishop becomes so powerful. There's a ton of ideas here. For example, uh, knight takes f3 comes to mind, but as the engine just showed, this is even stronger, of course. We attack the bishop. They don't have the move bishop before as well, and the knight is hanging. We're winning a piece. And so going backwards, after the move here, uh, c5, they gave back the material because they had to. They had no other option. It was necessary to give back the material to try to survive but still their job is hard in this end game. All of our pieces are in the game far more active than our counterpart pieces. And we simply, uh, you know, can slowly maneuver, get the king in and, and see kind of what gives. And eventually uh, black managed to break through here very successfully, very convincingly in this end game, their king got more active, their bishop and rook is always been more active. And finally, the pawn over here manages uh, to promote, as you'll see, we have d2 and eventually takes. If they were to take, of course, we can promote. I mean, I'm not very thorough in this analysis because, frankly, this endgame is not so important to understand the essence of the King's Indian, but you see that very quickly we managed to get uh, a nice initiative, a nice advantage. We were always in control because their king never got to safety. And that's sort of what happens in the sacrifice line where they choose to, to, to spend the time to take the pawn. Their king doesn't have the time to get safe. Now, alternatively, after c5, they don't have to take. So, for example, they can go d5, but now we go e6. And this kind of transforms now into a Benoni structure, um, where essentially, and I'll show this a little later in a different variation, we're going to try to expand on the queen side. We kind of have this uh, center all under control. And so you're going to be able to kind of see how this progresses in, in a little bit later as we move on to a different variation. Let's now go ahead and look at f4, a very aggressive option. If this is the first time you're seeing this, it might look very menacing, but the truth is it's not. We can still castle. If they go e5, that is far too premature. Notice that now c5 is coming and we're going to completely break down their pawn. They overextended and they have too many weaknesses now. They cannot maintain this huge and aggressive center that they went for. Um, and further, there's going to be weaknesses along this diagonal, as you're going to see with some other variations. And so alternatively, after they castle, they can try to prepare this with knight f3. But now we go c5. And again, c5 is a great uh, move here because it's a way to unbalance the situation where they're going for an aggressive um, king side launch. So we play a little bit on the queen side to offset that and make it very difficult for e5 to ever come with any sort of... Um, any sort of uh, real effect. And this is exactly what you see here. We win a pawn in this variation. I mean, alternatively, they don't have to push. They can go d5 instead, but now we go e6. And this is, again, what I was showing where we're going to go eventually for this uh, Benoni sort of structure with a queenside expansion. And something like this doesn't work. Queen a5, and we have a lot of pressure. This pawn is weak. There's, uh, you know, a pin going on here. Um, this pawn is potentially weak. 
you know, we have this all under control. And finally, if they choose to take this pawn on c5, then we go queen a5, another idea um, where we're sacrificing the pawn once again because we're getting huge play. And this is a really simple way to see that black is completely controlling the position. I mean, we're threatening to just win a pawn and, to, and completely crash through. This is a very good position for black. And so this is why the f4 pawn move, it's a little bit too aggressive. Um, it, it doesn't actually carry much merit because we can quickly destroy it by playing c5, where they don't have the security, they don't have the defense on the center in order uh, to launch these pawns. And so c5 is a very nice way. Our king is safe, their king is not. And so we're going to open up the position and, and utilize that fact. And so ladies and gentlemen, this takes us to the final variation, which is the Fianchetto variation. Now, one of the key characteristics of the Fianchetto is that it is quite effective when it comes to stopping the normal, typical King's Indian idea of going F5 and then F4, which kind of we saw earlier in the video. And the reason for this is because the pawn on G3 makes it so there's a good grip. And so F4 is not as effective as it typically is. And therefore, because the king side launch isn't so effective, guess what we go for? We're gonna go for C5 and go for a queen side assault. You can see how flexible this system is. Depending on what they're going for, if they're going and, and you know they're playing variations that are, are not so suitable to a king side attack, we go for a very effective queen side assault. And if they play the main line and allow us to go for a king side attack, we are very happy to follow through on that and actually, you know, cont continuously attack them and gain an initiative. And so, you know, from here, we have a very similar story. If they go d5, e6, we get into that Benoni. I have more of a continuation as I promised in the Benoni. This is the main idea. You put the rook on e8 to put pressure and then launch and expand on the queen side. And the moves, they really play themselves. I mean, these are so natural moves. Rerouting the knight, you know, using this pocket now for the knight um, and, and just putting the pieces where they belong. This is already a, a winning tactic here where we're, you know, we're attacking um, with the knight. The, the knight here, we're also you know, threatening to win the bishop, and they, they can't do much. I mean, if they defend, we're going to win the knight anyways. It's a very difficult position to, to navigate for white, and it's again because we have this huge control on the queen side matched with this huge bishop that's eyeing down this entire board. If this bishop opens up, if the king's Indian bishop gets that you know breath and, and the air that it needs, then it's really difficult for white to maintain any level of defense. And alternatively, if I go back one last line, after the move c5 here, they can choose to take once again, but again, it's just not so effective. We're going to take an, an endgame like this is not scary whatsoever. We're going to put the bishop on e6. It's quite difficult to defend, for example, b3, knight takes e4. Whoops, you're already losing more material again because the bishop opens up. And so it's difficult to defend this pawn. We already have the initiative. We're the ones throwing the punches it's really difficult for white to navigate these positions. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. That kind of takes us to the end. We looked at F3, the same-ish. We looked at the Fianchetto and, and um, also the line of F4. All of these three kind of sub variations, we meet by going C5. They're playing on the king side. We're going to attack on the queen side. And if they go for the main line and try to play instead on the queen side with this expansion, well, then we go for the king side assault with knight to c6 and knight to e7 and attacking like that. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. I know it's a lot to take in, so I'd urge you to use the PGN in the description to go ahead and study the moves for yourself. Make sure you subscribe if you're new around here and like what you see. Like this video if you learned something new from it, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.